everybody. How's it going? DeMarco Crum here. Sean Bryan here. We are here, episode one of Strength with a Purpose. So it's a video series that we're starting on YouTube, and we're going to talk about a lot of different stuff. We're going to talk about training, lifestyle, motivation, a bunch of different things to help you um, optimize your life to become the best version of you. Um, so this is episode number one. We're going to talk about ourselves a little bit, discuss, um, give you a little bit of intro, like who we are, what we're about, and what strength means to us. So, um, like I said, my name is DeMarco. I'm a, been a personal trainer for six years, and I've been in and out of the gym uh, pretty much for about 15 years at this point. So, runner, uh, did bodyweight stuff for a while, and uh, this last year I've been training with this uh, stud here and doing a bunch of kettlebell stuff. And so, for me, what got me into the gym originally was uh, when I was a kid. I was kind of that small, skinny kid who got beat up a lot. Um, got bullied quite a bit. I was, like I said, a little guy. I could run decently fast. When I figured that out, it kind of helped. <laughs> but uh, sure. Definitely got uh, definitely got bullied as a kid, and uh, it was tough. You know, I, particularly I remember in third grade, um, this kid named Kevin um, like snuck up behind me while we were in the classroom. The teacher had just left and uh, got a rear choke on me. Literally, did, like got me in a chokehold and pulled me halfway up out of my seat. And um, the whole class was sitting there. Everyone was just kind of sitting there. A couple people were laughing. Um, I'm sure as a kid, like stuff like that's funny. Um, but it was really humiliating. I mean, he was twice my size, and uh, I was powerless. There, at that point, there was nothing I could do. Um, luckily, he didn't kill me. <laughs> I'm still here. Uh, but he like put me down after probably like what felt like 15 to 20 seconds. What was likely about five. Um, but it was humiliating. I remember just being angry, and I still think about that sometimes. And sometimes it still kind of affects me. So um, if any of you guys have ever been bullied before, um, just know that uh, that I, I definitely relate to you. That and you can you're definitely not alone. So. Um, that just kind of went from a you know feeling of like anger, being mad, um, and just deciding one day that I just don't want that to ever happen again. Um, ironically, I never did martial arts or anything. I just I figured um, if I could just get stronger, put some muscle in my frame, people would decide not to mess with me anymore. They would figure, okay, if, if I walk a certain way and be confident, and or at least pretend and project confidence, people wouldn't screw with me anymore. So um, that's where that's where strength really started for me. Um, Remember reading, flipping through Muscle and Fitness magazine, Flex magazine back in the day. Arnold Schwarzenegger's arm workout, you know, did all that stuff back in the day, Same. and uh, sadly did not quite get where uh, where Arnold uh, got to in his prime. But you know, it's okay. Um, so, but for me, um, strength is very important, both physical as well as mental, um, and past that. So for me, building my body has has really transcended my life and transformed my life. I've I've become physically stronger. I move better. I feel better, and I'm confident. And uh, my mental health has improved. I just, I feel better. I have become a better person um, for coming to the gym and just physically building my body up. Um, my mental toughness and dis discipline have improved tremendously. And um, the great thing is, is that I'm finally now in a good frame of mind and position to, to really chase after my passions in life, which are to help other people. So um, that's something I very much care about. For a long time, I just wasn't in a position where I could do that. I needed to take care of myself and um, get myself in a good um, good frame of mind to be able to do that. So, And this tough guy here has uh, definitely been a big part of that because we've been training for uh, almost a year now. So, so about to hit our, about yeah. our anniversary. We'll see if he uh, does something special. I got something special so, planned. Better be, a, better be a freaking steak dinner, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Red wine, at least a $100 bottle, so. <laughs> oh, <I'm sorry. laughs> so but um, that's a little bit about me, so um, that's what strength means to me, so, Sean. Uh, kind of to go off of what he said a little bit, uh, as in elementary school, high school, all, all that, uh, you know, back in the day, I was definitely like 90 pounds soaking wet. So it was, a little, I definitely got picked on a little bit, but then kind of, you know, just started to shy away from that kind of stuff. So um, I did put on some weight when I started lifting um, around like college, but, uh, you know, high school, the bullying kind of went away, so that was good. Um, but I can at least relate a little bit to that. To, uh, kind of wanted to get a little bit bigger for that reason. But so at first it was more so the aesthetics, like I wanted to look a little bit bigger, but then once I started really getting into lifting, um, and like learning more about like the human body in college, um, I more so wanted to lift to get just stronger and healthier as opposed to like, oh, well, I want my arms to be bigger or that kind of thing. So more so uh, less aesthetics, more so just uh, moving better, like not being as achy, that kind of stuff. And since I'm able-bodied enough to work out, I want to be able to use that to my advantage, whereas other people unfortunately have certain disabilities that where they can't, you know, they may never be able to do the things that like, you know, someone as young as myself and as able-bodied as myself can do. So it was a big part of that, like, you know, if I'm able to do it, I might as well do it and, you know, do it with intent, get better, better at it, better and stronger. So um, as far as uh, the training, I've been here almost two years. Uh, and I would train a little bit before that uh, at an internship at um, an athletic facility with training people trying to go to college. 
uh, and on, like athletic scholarships. Uh, so that was cool. It was a different um, population for sure. But then when I came here and started working with you know, general population people, um, it was very very rewarding to kind of have any type of person come in and, and help them reach their goals, even if it's a little bit each day. Because uh, that's the thing is like it's not uh, the goals can be guaranteed to a degree if you if I put the time in, so do they. Uh, but it's you know it's a marathon, not a sprint. So they're not gonna get those six pack abs, um, you know, in a week or anything like that. They have to put the time in and you know. Um, be here on um, their own time as well as sessions with myself. So it's very rewarding to see um, people, you know, drop the weight that they're trying to lose for, you know, years prior to coming to see me uh, and just like, you know, make the training fun. I don't want them to come in to, to dread the training, um, although it will be difficult enough that they, uh, that that's what helps them see the results. You know, it's not going to be a cakewalk every time. Um, so for me, I always love helping people, you know, um, I, if my friends need to vent to somebody, I'm more than uh, happy to lend, lend my ear to them, uh, and which made it that much easier to want to help people training, basically. Like, I definitely have the patience for any kind of client that comes in, um, whereas if, you know, if I didn't have the patience for that or the desire to help people, you know, this wouldn't be the job for me. So, um, definitely going on two years now, I'm glad I made this decision to become a trainer and continue to um, increase my expertise as far as all the certifications and stuff I'm getting, because if I'm a uh, more uh, knowledgeable trainer, then my, my own training will um, increase as far as uh, me getting more towards the goals I have, as well as helping any client that comes in. You know, I want to be a better trainer every day, just like they want to be a better version of themselves every day. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> just to kind of dovetail off of that, that's uh, that's really what it's about. I mean, training, like when we do our workouts, obviously, um, you know, we're prioritizing ourselves. When we train our clients, um, we see so many different things happen. Like people come in, they have, just like Sean said, they have injuries they're working around. Um, some of them come in with some kind of disabilities. Um, a lot of times the gym is just their happy place. That's like the one place where they can actually have a good time. It's a stressful job, family situations. Um, you know, I trained, a, I trained a guy for a couple of years in his, in his early 60s now. And um, he, his mom is in her 90s. And I remember, um, I remember he was like having to take care of her. And um, she was, she had gotten so um, frail physically that he was having to assist her, actually get her up and down out of, you know, out of her bed in the mornings. Um, help her get back into bed at night, um, up and down off of the toilet, you know, little, you know, things that um, us young, able-bodied folks take for, you know, take advantage, um, or te uh, excuse me, take advantage, yeah. take for granted, excuse me. <laughs> uh, I, I gonna, knew you were going to get that. I was good at the exercise stuff, the uh, English and grammar were my strong point in school. <laughs> um, but that stuff that we take for granted, those uh, activities of daily living. But I, one day he came to me, he almost, he almost started crying, and he told me, he said, if we hadn't been doing deadlifts, training the core, if I hadn't gotten my body stronger, I physically wouldn't be capable of lifting my mom off of the toilet. And I mean, it's amazing. And he, um, that was like, that was an emotional why, like a reason behind training and why it's so important. You know, just like Sean said, aesthetics are cool and all, like we want to look good, we have a, you know, have a nice looking body and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, what actually matters is, is moving well and being, you know, what we call functional, being able to function really, really well. And when life throws demands and challenges your way, can you physically and mentally handle them and overcome those challenges? So that's um, that's a really big thing. And I just remember when uh, when my client JB um, told me about that, like I almost started crying. I was just like, oh my god, like that's that's amazing. Like I'm, you know, we're we're in our twenties right now, so we're we're not thinking about that kind of stuff right now. And our parents are still young enough to where that's not an issue. But um, definitely a reason to think more. Just like Sean said, marathon versus sprint. Like I want to be strong, you know, my whole life. I want to be able to move well and uh, and be able to care for others and uh, be able to take care of my family. You know, when people get older. So. Um, good stuff. So, Sean, do you have anything else to add? Or uh, yeah, go, kind of going off the older population as far as clients go, it's never too late to start. Um, yes, so, exactly. And exactly. that's what, that's why I'm glad that I'm you know knowledgeable enough to help you know the younger population as well as myself um, to basically that's kind of what you're doing is prolonging your life in a sense and mm -hmm. being able to Quality sustain life, the activities of daily living that uh, Demarco had mentioned you know as long as possible because you know the, unfortunately there will be a time where you know um, whether it's a some kind of disability presents itself where you just can't do anything about it. So yeah. um, you want to try to be able to, you know, like it's like move with intent in terms of, you know, being able to pick that um, like towel up off the ground that you just dropped, that kind of thing. Because a lot exactly. of people can't even do that. Yep. So um, to be able to still do that deep into your 70s and 80s, um, it starts now essentially, you know, uh, learning to move now and do, and do it properly, build that strength and, and continue to build it um, will you know, literally prolong your life and your um, capabilities deep into, you know, your later years. So that's 
a lot that, that's a lot of what the training is for now and people don't realize that they're thinking of like the short-term stuff um, like the aesthetics and all that kind of stuff which is great yeah. you want to lose the weight put on some muscle great but ultimately you're trying to live better be healthier for as long as possible you know yeah absolutely yeah and exactly like he said there are just a just um, just endless amounts of, um, of health benefits that you're going to get from from strength training everything and another thing just to just to kind of add on to this is a lot of people come in and they'll either be older and they'll think oh I can't train I'm I'm old and I'm frail and I can't do this kind of stuff or um, we'll get some guys like in their guys excuse me men and women in their like late 20s or early 30s sometimes even into their 40s and they they're coming from a sports background they've got some kind of injury and they're worried about either making that injury worse or um, another injury or you know, another, another incident that occurring guys just just to know I mean we've we've seen people come back from, from some crazy injuries that guy I told you about who is in his 60s take care takes care of his um, his elderly mother uh, this guy came to me with um, he had a, a partial tear in one rotator cuff full tear in the other one um, d doctor had diagnosed him with a degenerative disc disease in uh, I believe it was L4 um, if I remember correctly um, pain in his left knee um, and then some kind of vestibular issues, um, if I remember correctly, like basically um, he was having like balance um, issues that were that were um, that coincided with his eyesight. Um, so there was a lot of stuff that we that we either couldn't do or um, we had to modify. But that's where we just have to get creative. You know, training is an art and a science. There were, I mean, trust me, every single day he came in, uh, we would modify. Like, hey, JB, how are you feeling today? So, uh, such and such heard of me. Okay, awesome. You know. Just to give you a, an example, like he really wanted to bench press, like because bench press to most guys is like that's like the alpha male exercise, like how much do you bench, like that kind of BS. Mm -hmm. Ironically, we never bench press in our our training now. <laughs> I no. If I tried to bench now, you guys would probably laugh, you're like, dude, you're a scrub. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, what we would do with him is um, we would train that movement. We would simply shorten the range of motion. So we would bring that bar down um, to where just about where his upper arm was parallel. Um, to the bench or to the ground, whichever way you want to look at it, and then come back up and kind of focus on the top half of the lift. So he was able to train that movement. He was still able to train anterior delt, pec, tricep, obviously that grip to hold onto the bar, and we didn't get him hurt. So there are plenty of ways to work around exercises, guys. We've seen people with so many injuries come in here and still make uh, tremendous strength, uh, mobility, flexibility gains, uh, you know, cardiovascular as well. So don't ever think you're too old. Don't ever think you're too beat up. Um, you know, we're young. like. Pretty much, mostly able-bodied, you know, guys. Like for us, most of this stuff is uh, is you know easier relative to most folks. Of course, also factoring in our time training. But um, there's I've seen people do tremendous things despite um, you know countless injuries. So don't don't limit yourself. Don't ever limit yourself and think there's something you can't do. So we may have to modify it, but we can always do it. We can always do it. So Sean, do you have anything else to add? Uh, yeah, as far as modifications go, like it's. Speaking older population, or really anybody that's coming off of an injury, if you can't do something right away, obviously that you see, you know, someone um, across the way being able to do fairly easily, uh, that doesn't mean like, oh, I'm just gonna quit and go home. It means like Demarco said, modifications, and then like noting what they can do or what you can't quite do yet, so you can get there. So like the modification mm -hmm. is meant to build up that that um, strength through partial reps or or whatever it may be, and then eventually get you to that full range of motion. So just because you're not able to do it at the moment. Doesn't mean you know you want to quit or anything like that because you need to because um, you're just taking yourself out of the game. You want to stick with it so that eventually your end goal for that um, particular movement or whatever it may be is to get to that like I said full range of motion rep. Um, so yeah, that's a lot of what um, I try to tell my older population clients is just because you may not be able to do it now uh, doesn't mean you can't do it later. So it takes about two weeks to form a habit ish depending on what you're talking about. Uh, so like give it give it a solid two weeks. You'll not. You won't see the aesthetics that you may uh, want to see just right away, but the you'll feel the strength gains at least, and you you know it may be a little bit less achy rolling out of the bed in the morning, that kind of thing. So like you start to see those things, and then that gets you hooked. So after two weeks, just about you start to build off of that and get into more of a routine and like wanting to come, like oh I only came two days for the first two weeks, now I want to come to that third day, uh, and like you build up the strength and uh, and the desire to continue to come in and, and push towards your goals because. As we've said like three times already it's a mar it's a marathon not a sprint um, so don't you know don't expect to hit it on day one you know you may hit it on day 100 so exactly and that's you know it's gonna sound a little tongue-in-cheek but that's what we call a personal training right is um, it is personalized to where you are so um, you see someone come in and smash like a you know a 600 pound deadlift or something you're like oh my god that's amazing I would love to be able to do that but let's say you can only hit like 200 pounds like you know I, 
it, it's all a process. That person that's picking up that much weight, I guarantee you they've been in the gym at least four or five years, minimum, probably longer to yeah. get to that point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, factoring in some other things, of course, you know, assuming they're, you know, not on gear or whatever, but, um, but all that kind of stuff. So like you said, it's a process and uh, the key is just start now. I mean, just, just get in, um, get uncomfortable. I can't tell you how many times uh, Sean would teach me a new movement and I would look like a fish, like just out of the water, like flailing around. Um, very uh, uncoordinated and looking like a like a rookie like been training for you know I've been I had been training for five years and I was like oh I can do all this crap and then like kettlebell swing for instance which we're gonna get into after this um, I Sean said hey show me your kettlebell swing I'm like oh I've been I've been doing swings for three years man I'm, I know these I know these things I did a set of ten and he went okay those are pretty good but three different like I think he showed me three like maybe three or four different things to fix and um, and it made a huge difference um, and I was just like oh wow. Maybe I should listen. <laughs> so, but it's uh, but it's, it's a process. Like even us, like he trains me, um, and uh, like even trainers have trainers. So it's uh, everyone's learning. We're always students, and uh, I you'll never hear me say this. I'm sure you'll never hear Sean say this either. Um, never gonna call ourselves experts. Um, we're students. We're learning. Um, we do. We're professionals, of course. We've learned and we've taken our education to um, help others and teach others. But um, you'll never hear me use that word describing myself. So. Um, that's definitely something for me. Kind of think of it more as, like you said, marathon, not a sprint. So, um, Sean, do you have anything else to add before we move to the next phase? Um, so, yeah, just real quick to wrap that up. Um, I definitely agree that, you know, we're very close to being experts for the, uh, for the most part. Like, we, our goal is to be able to teach you movements to do them properly and safely. Uh, but that's the thing, like, as you're training yourself, not only are we training ourselves um, as far as exercise go, but also to become better trainers. So. Uh, there's just uh, so many different things out there as far as uh, knowledge goes in terms of uh, how the body moves and like oh like oh, this modification didn't work for this person now I got to do a little bit more research to find out another way to um, you know re reverse engineer that and get them to where you want to be because the same thing's not going to work for everybody so uh, in doing so we're also you know training ourselves so we're not uh, it's not like we're never going to pick up another book or do research again in our lives like oh right. we know everything that's it like no like other clients will come in where you'll need to. You know, really buckle down and figure out like why they can't do this particular thing yet and then to get them to be able to do it because you know, the same modifications and troubleshooting drills won't work for everybody so um, that's why we're you know near expert at this point but we're, we're learning every day just like you are um, so you know that's progress for both of us yeah well said absolutely awesome man um, all right guys so we're gonna move into next phase and um, Sean and I are gonna break down the kettlebell swing so these first six episodes that we do um, we're gonna go through these six um, fundamental kettlebell movements. So the very first one we're gonna go over is the kettlebell swing, and um, basically it is it is amazing. It it does everything, and uh, we're gonna get into that um, the very next thing. And super pumped. So all right, guys. Awesome. All right, guys, we're gonna go over the kettlebell swing and some um, like starting movements to basically get you into that because the swing stem stems from the hip hinge position. Um, and uh, that's a kind of fancy way of saying like a deadlift position, for example. Most people are familiar with that, uh, as opposed to the swing, who you know that may be more of a poor concept. So uh, I'm going to set the mark off on a kettlebell deadlift just to really um, focus on the the angle of the torso to the ground and all that kind of stuff. Because uh, if you can nail that, then obviously that much closer to being able to do a proper swing, I would just throw someone into the swing if I've never seen their hip inch before. So um, I'm going to have him get over the bell. Um, and have it pretty much as if it runs across like a barbell would because you want it tight to the shins and then from here What he's going to do is um, He's going to basically he's going to put his hips in the crease um, oh, Sorry his hands and hips of his, uh, the crease of his hips He's going to chop them back like this because that allows you to feel that loading of the hips um, To the point where your shins are just above vertical to the ground and you can feel your weight over your heel Because uh, we're going to drive through the heel so that uh, when you chop the hips back you can feel yourself in that loaded position um, so now from here, he's going to want to keep his back nice and flat as he grabs the bell. So he's going to grab the horns of the bell. Um, notice how his hips go down a little bit lower. That's totally fine because he has to get low enough to grab the bell, of course. He's going to pretend like he's trying to snap that horn in half because that tucks his elbows in and activates his lats a little bit more so he can uh, really keep his back engaged. Uh, and from there, what he's going to do is basically stand up as fast as he can. So the reason I say that is because uh, when you explode through your hips and get that hip extension in there, uh, it, it, depending on how heavy the bell is, it's gonna help you pull it off the ground. If you approach it slowly, um, you know, it may not go as smoothly. It may look slow, but he knows he's actually moving his hips you know, at a decent pace to be able to pull that weight off the ground. 
albeit as a pretty light weight for him. So, and then from here, basically what he wants to do is track the same exact movement all the way back down. So he's going to initiate it by throwing his, throwing his hips back first, and then just tracking that bell down the same way he brought it up. So he's gonna touch the ground exactly where he left it from. So he's established that he can get into that loaded position. You don't, want, you don't want your thighs too low to the ground to the point where it's like a squat, because then you're kind of, you're meshing two different um, movements of the hips together. You want to differentiate the squat and the hip hinge, so you don't want to you don't want to squat your deadlifts or your swings. So that's why we want to make sure that um, the angle of the hip and the torso to the ground is pretty consistent. Uh, so he's established that he can do that, which means we're that much closer to being able to do the swing. So um, yeah, you notice how he um, backed up a little bit because uh, what we want to do here is basically to get a, a hike in because that's what's going to help us create that counter movement to be able to um, effectively get the bell up to um, the Chest, chest level, uh, this position, uh, but obviously there's a little bit more between that for sure. So what he's gonna do is, same setup, he's gonna chop those hips back, only this time he's gonna grab the bell from there, he's gonna tilt it a little bit to bring it in a little bit closer. So from here, what he wants to do is, he's gonna hike it back like he's a center in football, and then once it, once it reaches his thighs, He's going to rapidly extend to the hips and he's squeezing his glutes at the top because that, what that's going to do for him is allow the belt to float and keep it, uh, make it so that his uh, body is nice and straight from his head to his toe. If he, if he wants to pull with his shoulders instead, what's going to happen is he might arch that back a little bit uh, and that's not going to feel too good on the back and it's going to take away from the, from, the, from the movement itself. So he's going to hike it up and back and explode through those hips. So notice, notice when he breaks his hip is around the time where his uh, his wrist reaches hips. You don't want to hinge too early or too late because um, then it's not going to look as fluid as this. Keep in mind he's been doing swings with me and just in general for a, a very long time. Um, so it may not look as natural to someone who's just picking a bell up for the first time. Uh, but that's ultimately where you want to get to. Uh, to be honest, there's no such thing as a perfect swing or uh, attaining that is very is near impossible. Um, I definitely, I don't believe I've ever done a perfect swing. Uh, nor does DeMarco, and it's just, it's near perfect, but it's not the, not optimal for the most part. There's just so many moving parts um, in terms of how ballistic the movement is that it's kind of tough to achieve that completely. Uh, to be able to do a lot of, a lot of volume on the swing and not have it um, be painful or anything like that, that day or even the next day, that's the main goal. That's what we're trying to get to. Um, do you have anything to add to that? Um, actually, just, just talk about um, the why. Why should we do a kettlebell swing? Perfect. So the why for the swing would, uh, would definitely be we're basically trying to bulletproof our posterior chain, and what I mean by that is, you know, in layman's terms, I suppose, it's just all the muscles behind us, I guess, if you want to simplify it that much. So specifically our glutes, like our hamstrings and stuff like that. Um, our lats are working as well, because if um, our lats aren't engaged during the swing, what's gonna happen is like my shoulders are gonna be pulled more so this way, because it's uh, my lats unpacked. Uh, so, and what, what happens if you approach it that way is like the bell's gonna be a little bit longer than usual, and, and what that may do is have the bell sweep down by the ankles, uh, and you want the forearms to connect to the thighs at the bottom. So if your lats are unpacked, the bell's gonna sweep lower than usual, and now my elbows are kinda hitting my thighs, so it's gonna have that next swing after that feel even, even you know, um, not as good for the most part. So if you have your lats packed the whole time, your lats are isometrically engaged for the most part, so that, you know, you're working your lats as well. So um, to have a solid swing means you're, uh, it will stem to other movements such as like um, the kettlebell deadlift, as I mentioned, because we just did that, as well as barbell deadlift. So we're, really working on um, bulletproofing our posterior chain um, and really make, like, make it so that we don't have back problems in the future, that kind of thing, um, as well as the endurance part of it. So it's a strength endurance exercise. So if you're not only are you gaining strength, um, you're getting your endurance up for like, you know, other activities that you might like running, um, playing basketball, that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. And the great thing about the swing is just, just to add to what Sean talked about, um, the great thing about the kettlebell swing is when done properly, it's actually very, very good and easy on your joints compared to running. So if you are a competitive runner, you know, you're running half marathons, marathons, um, up to a certain point, running more is going to enhance your, your performance, obviously, because you need to be able to train um, specific to the demands of your sport. But that being said, you can enhance your performance with exercises like the kettlebell swing that aren't going to beat your joints up. Because I'll be honest with you guys, running is hard on the body. Um, but if it's your if it's your passion, you love to do it, then then do it. There's nothing wrong by saying don't run. But you can do exercises like the swing that would help build up that um, that obviously that strength and aerobic capacity, but not beat your joints up because there's no impact on the knees and the ankles and the hips and everything. So um, it's it's just effective. Every single client I train does swings. Um, I, pretty much every client he does, with a few exceptions, of course, if there's some kind of uh, kind of disability or issue. 
but even then, that's when we're talking about uh, you know, modifying, making adjustments. So right. hip hinge is a critical uh, movement pattern to learn and to be proficient in, and it'll, uh, it does everything. Like guys like um, out there, guys and girls that want to get a stronger deadlift, uh, do the kettlebell swing. Your deadlifts will shoot up. I, we did swings um, for probably, we've been doing them consistently for three or four months. And I added about 60 pounds to my deadlift. I mean, it was impressive. I mean, technique was part of it, but um, swings will, like, it'll do everything, so. Right, so to go off of that um, swing and deadlift uh, pairing, uh, I hadn't done much deadlifting at all because I was more so focused on um, a certain other goal of, like, getting a certain certification, so I wasn't touching the barbell, really. And basically, the same thing. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't add 60 pounds necessarily, but I was able to maintain my weight and add, even add a little bit to that, so. Mm -hmm. To get better at certain movements, yeah, you gotta do those movements, but that doesn't mean that other movements can't complement them well enough that you can maintain it if you don't you know, do it as frequently, of course. If not, maybe add a little bit more weight as, uh, as previously mentioned because um, if they're, they, they're both the same movement. The barbell, you're pulling up the body instead of the kettlebell, you're popping off, but it stems from the same thing. Even though the deadlift may look slow, you know, you, you know um, that you're moving your hips just as fast as you do in a swing, it just doesn't look that fast. Um, so that being said, they're both rapid hip extension exercises. Um, only one obviously is going to look a little bit faster than the other. Um, so as far as the swings go, I have I do have another client in mind that um, she takes my classes primarily, but we do the swings in classes, uh, and she uh, has progressed with the swing fairly well. That um, she started the marathon before we had met to uh, to work out together. Um, so like the swings didn't uh, didn't quite get to help out with that. But the next marathon she ran. Um, she shaved off a decent amount of time because the endurance of the swing and just everything else we did in the classes helped her with that. So yes, she was running, so that obviously helped her get better running as well, but the she uh, truly feels that the swings and just other strength training exercises we did uh, helped her be more um, conditioned for that next marathon she ran. So had she just focused on only the running, you know, she may not have done as well as she did. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, I think the, the one of the really coolest things about this is like he and I, like I said, we've been training for almost a year. Um, I haven't gone, gone on a run once. I haven't gotten on a Stairmaster or a bike or a rower once. Well, we did the Assault Bike Challenge, but like that was a very short duration. I haven't done any steady state cardio, with the exception of walking my dog, um, which is super, super low intensity, obviously. And I don't even count that as exercise. That's just, I just like walking. <laughs> and so um, I'm not like timing myself or anything like that. But um, I've done no steady state cardio. However, I've been able to um, drop through training with him, learn the kettlebell stuff, do more swings. I've taken two inches off my waist and I've also gained weight. So I've, gu I've built muscle, but I've also burned fat, um, which is fantastic. I feel better, move better, and um, swings, kettlebell swings, um, and then snatches, which we'll get to in the future, um, have really, really changed my, my training. And I think for every single person out there, um, swings are fantastic. If you're a power lifter and you want to talk about um, one of the best um, accessory movements for the deadlift, kettlebell swing, hands down. Like you said, rapid hip extension, being explosive. Um, from that bottom position all the way up to the lockout, um, swings will do it. And they're going to train you to get in, like you talked about, that same lockout position that you're in at the top of the swing. So there's a swing, there's a deadlift, glutes tight, abs tight, lats locked in. It's the same thing. The only difference is where are your hands. Um, so and of course the load's going to be light. Uh, excuse me, the load's going to be lighter on a kettlebell swing versus on a deadlift. But um, there's these movements are a lot more related than people realize. And uh, there's a lot of carryover, and that's a really, really cool thing. Is you're learning how to get in those positions, and then someone knows how to do a deadlift, and then you tell them, just lock out like you would a deadlift, and then they're like, oh, I know how to do that. Boom, and a power, and then you're there, and then you're in that, in that strong position. So, awesome. Do you have anything to add about the swing, Sean? Uh, just kind of going off the, um, the fact that he said that he was able to burn fat and put muscle on, um, it's the kettlebell is basically like a handheld gym. Like, I love using them for that reason because, you know, if you go to the gym and plan on barbell deadlifting or just anything with barbell or dumbbell. Maybe the gym is packed at that time and those pieces of equipment are being used to be able to just grab another piece of equipment being the kettlebell and get a whole workout in. And really like, you know, 30 to 45 minutes, maybe an hour at the most, um, you can get more done than you would have with the other stuff. Um, so just to be able to intelligently train with something else instead of like, oh, everything I want to use is gone, I'm just gonna go home or like hop on the treadmill. Exactly. Like, you, know, you can grab this instead get a full body workout in, um, in maybe even half the time. So it's just, um, it's crazy the benefits of the kettlebells. Uh, and I'm not trying to bash out of those other things that you want to do. Uh, it's just a good way to switch things up for the most part because the body craves variety. So um, for the most part, people don't really know how to effectively do these yet. So that's putting those into the, um, to their training regimen can, can yield you know, crazy results.
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And just like Sean said, I mean, now um, on days when we train, he obviously tells me what to do, and it's awesome. I have to think, <laughs> which is freaking awesome, uh, worth every penny. Uh, <laughs> but um, then, but he's but um, in all seriousness, you can pick up a single piece of equipment, or in some cases two, which we'll get to in the future, like double bell movements, um, and you can do an entire full body workout. And then what we'll do afterwards on the seventh episode, um, Sean's going to run us through the deep six. We're going to talk about how you can um, put all those movements together and turn it into the ultimate ass kicking circuit where uh, you're gonna laugh because I'm gonna almost die because I almost died last time, but, <laughs> but but it's amazing. So I always joke that it, I feel like my heart's gonna explode out of my chest like in the movie Alien um, for huh. those of you that are sci-fi nerds out there like I am, so. Get ready for a lot of pop, pop culture references. Yeah, just, that's yeah. Really awesome. comic books, uh, sci-fi stuff, you're gonna hear it, um, so just be ready. Um, but guys, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna get into some other stuff now. We're gonna have some fun. So next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk to you guys about um, what bracing your core means, using your core. I'm sure you guys have heard that before, heard about how it helps enhance posture, makes you stronger and that kind of stuff. We're gonna give you a rundown of why you should do it and the probably the simplest cue for how to do it. Because the how is very, obviously to me, it's just as important as the why, because a lot of people kind of get that kind of mucked up and kind of get confused. So, all right guys, next phase, teach you how to use your core. All right, so brace your core. I'm sure you guys have heard this uh, probably a million times in the gym. Uh, for those of you that train with a personal trainer, uh, hopefully you know what this means and, and what you know why it's important. Um, you've probably heard somebody say it um, in the gym, heard some or, or overheard a trainer tell their client to do it. Uh, probably have an idea of what it means and why it's important, but maybe don't uh, kind of know the whole story, know why why it's critical. But obviously, like we talked about earlier, how to do it. Um, so we're going to show you a couple different uh, simple cues after that. Um, to give you kind of the how. But basically, as far as the core goes, um, it's gonna give you everything. Bracing your core, that's part of your foundation. That's gonna give you stability, which is gonna give you the, the, the stability, is gonna give you the ability to generate force and make you stronger. So um, whenever somebody does a deadlift, a squat, a bench press, um, watch a video. Watch, watch a professional powerlifter do those lifts and you're gonna see their entire body's gonna get tight. Um, you're gonna see also their faces are gonna get red. We'll get that we'll get to that in the future But that's about the, the breathing and bracing together, but bracing your core um, generating what we call intra-abdominal pressure is critical to protecting your spine during um, an exercise so um, I actually just read um, give a shout out to dr. Stu McGill. I just read his book the back mechanic um, and it talks about how your core musculature the primary um, um, the primary task um, that they um, that they perform is to um, generate tension to create stability in your core. So we'll talk about this in the future. A lot of core exercises that people do are actually um, actually not as good for you as you think. They're actually potentially damaging your back. We'll do that in the future. But basically, these muscles, your rectus abdominis, your obliques, your rectus spinae, they are responsible for getting tight and stabilizing your spine so that you're safe under a load. So you think about whenever you have a barbell on your back and you're going into a barbell squat, um, that bar is directly over your spine. So there's what we call a compressive force on your spine. So that bar is there. So you can imagine if someone's coming down into a squat and they start to do what I call the quasi-moto, that's very, very dangerous, obviously, for your back. That puts a lot of what we call shearing force on your spine, and a lot of bad stuff happens on that. We never want to see that happen on a squat. That's why we always stand um, directly behind someone to spot them on a squat, and um, obviously to maintain safety, and then also if um, whenever someone's doing a deadlift, we stand to the side so that we can look at that lower back. We really ideally want no movement in there at all. So what you're focusing on is getting your abs as tight as you can. And what I always tell my clients is I want you to act like Mike Tyson's about to punch in the gut. I personally would probably just run away um, because um, he still is tough. He's still a pretty tough dude. I definitely want to, wouldn't want to mess with him. Um, but one of the simple cues that we give um, people is like, like I said, prepare like you're about to be hit. So um, we don't like to hit people. That's not part of our training. We don't do any of that kind of stuff here. Unless but, uh, you guys want that. It's right. I, you have to pay extra for it. But yeah, if you're into yeah. that sort of thing, we'll beat you up during your session. So. <laughs> so, but the big thing, just know the tighter you get here, the more stable you are here and the safer you're going to be, particularly on the big lift, squat, bench, deadlift, overhead press. Um, I just listed four. But <laughs> those exercises stability in that lower back is critical. We don't want any shifting of those discs. I always tell people, uh, stack the bricks. I always tell people the top of the squat, the deadlift, um, and the overhead press, think of your discs as bricks. I want those bricks stacked vertically. 
here. You don't want to be over here. I always tell people, you don't want to be Quasimodo during a squat or deadlift, and you don't want to be Neo. You don't want to be in either of those positions. You want to be nice and tall and rigid. So one of the cues that we like to use um, with each other, we don't do this with everybody, is um, using your core, I want you to act like you're about to be hit. So I'm going to take this. So you'll notice, so if you relax for a second, Sean, so watch out. There's a lot of give. There's no core tension. Now, you notice it starts bouncing off of his gut. That level of tension is what you need to provide that stability in your lower back. So it's kind of silly, it looks kind of silly, um, but it, it's one of the easiest places to do that. So get someone you trust, you know, either your trainer or a workout partner, take the stick, or you can even just punch it. You can take your fist, don't go crazy, obviously, don't get too, uh, too excited about this, um, but start punching. So notice the loose, relax. Now, you hear that, it's literally like I'm punching a rock wall. Um, and when you feel that, you know that's what I need to go on my squat or my deadlift or my, or my press, um, whether it be bench or overhead. So that's one of the cues that we love to do. Um, another simple one is, um, Sean, if you'll lie down on your back for me. Um, another one we like to do, um, channeling my, uh, my inner kickboxer here, uh, because this is definitely what he did during the, uh, during the training for John Claude. He was getting ready for Tom Poe. Um, except he wasn't using a ball, he was using like a melon or something. So um, this is one of the simplest ones here. So we're gonna take this ball and um, definitely brace on this one. Let's not, let's not do a soft one. So he's gonna brace those abs and you notice, you heard that thud and that hit. Um, it bounced off of his core because he was tight. I'll tell you right now, had he not braced, that would have hurt like hell. It would have literally hurt his stomach um, and he would have felt that pressure. But had, since he braced and got tight, um, it didn't affect him, it just bounced off of him. So. Um, it's a good thing we didn't use something uh, something fragile because it would have shattered. That would have been uh, <laughs> really bad. Yeah. ends or a base. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but um, those are the two simple cues you can use. Um, get get like I said, get someone you trust. Someone that's not going to be crazy and like try to try, try to actually hurt you because that's not the goal. The goal is just to use that as a good cue. To, like, okay, get tight. This is what I need to do. Um, so that's just a couple simple cues on using the core. Sean, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, going off a simple cue part is like, you know, not everybody res not everything resonates with everybody as far as like one cue you use, just like I mentioned in the video earlier, uh, not every modification you get for somebody is going to work as mm -hmm. far as like troubleshooting mm -hmm. drills. So you got to get creative, think of something else to give them to finally get them to uh, understand like exactly what you're trying to tell them to do because not everybody's going to understand the scientific, you know, uh, nomenclature we're using, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so and a lot of people wanna, also just don't care. <laughs> well, exactly. You want to try to simplify it as much as possible. So like, um, like he had mentioned, like basically bracing your stomach so if someone's about to punch you, like everyone knows how to do that. I'm sure someone's taken a punch to the gut from some somebody at one point in their life. Um, and then like another good one is like suck your belly button into your back because when you do that, like you're, you're shorting up the core to the point where it's completely activated and it'll take out any of that spinal um, extension and flexion that you don't want in certain movements. Um, certain movements may call for a spot, like uh, flexion extension, but again, not, not one that's particularly loaded like the main movements he had just mentioned. Um, so like that's that can make or break a certain exercise. Like if, if you want to hit a certain weight, you need your core to, to be able to um, uh, protect the spine throughout it. Like in reality, you may be shaving off a bunch of weight on like your deadlifts if, if, if the core isn't engaged. Like if you want to hit three fifteen, for example, um, you're not you for the most part, depending on who you are, you're not going to hit that if your if your core is not engaged. So you may be stuck on a two twenty five. Uh, if you know if you're not completely engaging everything that you need to so that can make or break the lift or make or break you for the most part so you really exactly. want to really want to make sure that you're uh, not putting yourself in a uncomfortable position especially under load um, that's gonna just you know push you back because if you're hurt you can't train so if um, exactly. that's only gonna prolong your goals and maybe even have to start over start fresh depending on how um, much you know how debilitating the injury may be so you just don't want to put yourself in that position Absolutely. Yeah, and it's all about safety, guys. I mean, hitting PRs and smashing crazy weight on, on Instagram is, is cool and all, and it's fun, but um, we focus on training very, very light to start off, learn the movement, train the pattern really, really well, then we start adding weight. So if we see some breakdowns of technique, Sean's had to do it for me before. If my technique starts to break down on the weight, uh, we drop down. You know, you got to check you at the door and uh, do it right. You know, you, you can't progress until you're ready. Um, so just use those cues. Kind of use. You can even use them, like, if you're kind of still getting used to, to like how to, how to brace and use your core, do that a couple times before a squat or a deadlift or a bench. That'll give you that, okay, that, that repetition, like, okay, I know how to do that. Okay, I know how to get tight and prepare um, for the lift. So uh, that's awesome. A couple cues for you there. And um, all right, guys, so next thing we're going to get into, we're going to have some fun. We're going to show you how to properly hype up for a video, or excuse me, for a lift. Um, how to hype up for a lift. So these are the only techniques I want to see you guys using to prepare whenever you're getting ready to uh, smash your PR. Um, so definitely take these seriously. This is very, very important information. And this is really what we were wanted to show you guys 
Um, so we're very, very pumped.